University. He has done great things for us, and he's a man of God, and I ask you to please give him your heart and your mind for the next a little bit. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon. Good to be with you today. I have to be on my best behavior since Roy Johnson, one of our board members, is here. <laughs> and so, good to see you, Roy. Uh, really good to be with you. What a great program this is this week, and a lot of just uh, 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 great opportunities, and this is probably not one of them, but uh, we're glad to have you here. Do you all uh, have se- Senior Sunday at your church? We bring up the seniors and kind of honor them, the high school seniors, give them a Bible and a blessing. A lot of churches do that. I still remember the time when I was a high school senior and they brought me forward. Gave me, I still have the Bible. I, I saw it in a box the other day that the, my church in Ohio gave me when I graduated. I mean, I love those. I, I mean, I don't even have to know the seniors graduating now. It's just an emotional time because you think about the magnitude of the moment and what's just about ready to happen. And it's, it's heart-wrenching to think about. Uh, as much as I love Senior Sundays now, it's somewhat bittersweet, too. Because when you really reflect on what's happening to high school seniors who grow up in our fellowship, uh, we can take any 10 of them. Take any 10 of them. And 12 months later, only three will be there. Tonight, we're going to have 400, Mike, we're going to have 400 kids here tonight for part of the area-wide. And my guess is that they're not any different than everybody other other Church of Christ kid in America. Because if we follow them, 300 of them are going to be gone. When you talk about that level of percentage, we're not talking about the kids on the fringe. We're talking about kids that go to youth events. They go to church camp. Boy, they even participate in Lads the Leaders. Something tragic has happened. So when I go to Senior Sunday now, it's bittersweet when you think about, wow, that's what's happening. And in, in my work, I get a chance to talk to a lot of high school seniors and their parents. And most of them think, it will never happen to them. But if it's happened to 70%, it's happened to most of them. Obviously, church leaders are scrambling, absolutely scrambling to think about what are we going to do to stem the tide. Regrettably, I think all the attention is on Sunday morning. We better jack it up on Sunday morning or they'll keep keep leaving. And some churches jack it up on Sunday morning and they still leave. Despite all the theatrics that some churches go through, they're still plowing out the back door. Ministers across the country are preparing sermons. Lectureships are dedicated to uh, this issue. Uh, Christian publications are diving into this issue to see if we can't tease out what's really happening and what really God calls us to be about. And uh, recently with the pandemic, the anxiety is actually growing because groups are looking at just Christians broadly and saying that as the pandemic opens back up, maybe one third of members may not return. And some are forecasting that two-thirds of the young people won't come back. The researchers are surveying these kids as fast as they can go to kind of get some sense of what's happening. And uh, the number one response is that they believe the church is no longer relevant. It appears to be a a growing movement. Certainly you've read this too, that a a number, the people that they categorize as nuns, they don't believe in in God, that number is growing, but that's not this population. This population that's going to church in high school and then vacating a year later, not part of the ones, they just didn't wake up 12 months later and say, I don't believe in God anymore. They say they're religious. They say they're spiritual. But they don't go to church. And there's a disconnect, isn't it? 
a complete disconnect to say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, but I don't really think there's any interest in going to church. That's a problem. I saw an article, or a publication, and all the articles in this publication were dedicated to the the purpose of the church, the benefits and the blessings of the church in light of what's happening, this exodus of young people. And every article was absolutely spot on with the truth as they talked about doctrine, what God calls to happen in the Christian assembly and about governance within the church. All of it was absolutely truth breathed from the word of God. But there was one part or one topic that was completely absent. And it wasn't just in this publication, but I think it's absent from the conversation uh, on a whole, is this um, opportunity, is it what's the church's impact on the world? It's actually addressing the question that the, the researchers are asking. Why are you leaving? They're saying it's no longer relevant in the world. And yet many of our publications and our conversations as it relates to the Exodus it omits the very question that they're raising. Is the church relevant in the world? It appears that most of our conversation tends to be pretty insular. What happens within the four walls? It's interesting to me that as I have hung around college students, most of which um, attend a Christian college, you know what the number one goal of most of them not most of them, but a lot of them, a recurring thing that I hear, is they want to start a nonprofit. They're burdened by the the challenges of society. They're burdened by the hurting people that they see in their community. And their response is, let's start a nonprofit. I don't have anything against nonprofits. In fact, at Faulkner, we partner with lots of nonprofits to help our students have opportunities to serve within the community. But why does a believer in Jesus Christ feel the need to start a nonprofit? It's because they don't believe that the church is God's vehicle for bringing out the redemption and the restoration of all things. They suddenly see a nonprofit as a way to serve hurting people in their community. I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. I don't know why that would be true. Why, would, why don't they view the church? Why isn't the church viewed? Why aren't they coming to the elders and say, listen, I'm burdened by the people in my community. Why can't we serve them? But they'll quit going to church and start a nonprofit or volunteer as a, a local nonprofit serving the needs of the community. And to me, that continues to be a disconnect. If the church is going to reflect the teachings of Jesus, it will be both internally and externally focused. We see Jesus spending time with the disciples, preparing them for a time when he would no longer be with them. But we also see a vast majority of his time working with those outside the twelve. I'm afraid these young people are identifying an issue that the church has become a building. It's become an event. It's no longer a body. It's no longer a movement. It's become a place. The church is supposed to be the proof of the gospel. John 13, a very familiar, uh, verse 34 and 35, a very familiar text. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The default interpretation of this verse, at least most of my life, has been if we love one another, is Christ loved us? It's a testimony. But this verse, in context of the rest of Jesus' teaching, doesn't just limit it just to love with inside the walls of the church. His lifestyle would suggest the love is not restricted just to believers. In reality, it doesn't capture anyone's attention if I love my wife, if I love my children, if I love my siblings. 
that doesn't differentiate me from anybody in Montgomery, Alabama, for that matter. Nobody thinks it's extraordinary that I love the people at my church. That's not capturing the attention. The love that captured the attention was the love that was extended to a Samaritan woman. It was the invitation to a tax collector. It was the touch. The touch of a leper. The love that Jesus was referring to in John 13 was not potlucks, care groups, or card showers. It was reckless, unconstrained, tidal wave of love, mercy, and compassion, and it was displayed and shared with everybody. To me, that is the love that will show the world that we are really from the Father. I think it's intriguing to think about the impact of the first century church. Our New Testament really gives us a window into only about five decades of the early church. But historians actually give us a little bit more to think about as we think about early ancient Roman culture. Dr. James Kennedy wrote this. He said, life was expendable prior to Christianity's influence. In those days, abortion was rampant. Abandonment was commonplace. It was common for infirmed babies or unwanted little ones to be taken out into the forest or the mountainside to be consumed by wild animals or to starve. And they often abandoned female babies because women were considered inferior. There's gladiator contest, sex, sexual pro promiscuity, homosexuality, marginalization of women. This was a barbaric culture that this new Christian movement was born into. But these Christians had a completely different worldview. They had a dramatically uh, different look and value for human life. They cared about the sick. They cared about the disabled. They cared about the elderly and the marginalized. The Christians, prompted by their faith, were the first ones who launched hospitals and orphanages in this barbaric culture. The influence of the early church elevated the value of women. They had a good Samaritan ethic. And so they were benevolent. And they gave charity. Their influence even impacted the court system and higher standards of justice. In essence, the church transformed the Roman Empire. The growth of Christian thought and practice was the catalyst for one of the most important reforms in the moral history of mankind. Because prior to this time, Roman culture wasn't much different than every other culture prior to it. It was barbaric on every front. And the introduction of Christian behavior, and Christian teaching, and the church of Jesus Christ started infiltrating this barbaric culture and it changed. To better understand and appreciate the impact of the church, I think it's also enlightening to think about some of the demographical information. It's believed that the world's population in the first century was about 200 million people. Now, in context, there's about 328 million people in the United States. So, 200 million is still a lot of people, but it's a fraction of what the world's population is today. And what do we know about the numbers of the first century church? Not a lot. There were 12. There were 70 that were sent out, Luke chapter 10. 3,000 baptized they have Pentecost. After that, I'm struggling to find a number. I mean, I just, I just know it's a small little band of people. And so historians believe that there were only about 100 churches in A.D. 100. 100. Dr. Rodney Stark is a scholar who studies this. I mean, it's speculation still, but, you know, in looking at historical documents, he believes that there was only about 40,000 Christians in A.D. 100. 150. By AD 200, he believes that number grew to 218,000. That's a pretty precise number, but that's the number he gave. And by AD 250, the number who professed to be Christians grew to 1.2 million. And by the third century, the Roman Emperor, Emperor Constantine, converts to Christianity. 
this barbaric, pagan culture completely transformed by Christians and the body of Christ. From Constantine on, we see Christians making powerful pro uh, contributions and progress to the advancement of the world. Just to pick out a few, the abolition of slavery. William Will Wilberforce, the British evangelical who led the uh, abolition of slavery in Britain. Two-thirds of the American abolitionists here in the States were Christian ministers. Christians infiltrated every facet of higher education. Every, every, that means all of them, every European university was started by Christian scholars. In the United States, one out of the first 123 colleges in America was not Christian. And that was my alma mater. University of Pennsylvania. And Benjamin Franklin was not exactly a pagan, but he wanted a more practical college. But the other 123 or 122 colleges, the first 122 colleges that started in America were Christian. This is Harvard's founding statement. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ which is eternal life. But you can't say that at Harvard today. But it was Christians that infiltrated education to make a difference in the world. Let's look at a sliver of Jesus' life. And I'm taking about one sliver and see if this doesn't speak to anything that we're talking about as far as the impact of the body of Christ in the world. Um, do you remember how... Jesus is portrayed in Sunday school. He's larger in life. I mean, superhero. And you, you go to vacation Bible school or you go through, you know, it's just fun to go through the K through 6 area of your church and, and just listen to the stories and how they portray Jesus. It's a miracle Sunday. Every Sunday we're going to talk about another. We're going to talk about Jesus Christ, the divine being. And his divine power. And that's how he's portrayed. But as we grow old, older, we realize that the, the miracles are really played down in the Gospels. They're really played up in, in Sunday school, but they're played down in the Gospels. And most of them are performed in obscurity and uh, asked to be kept quiet. Most of Jesus' miracles, he said, don't tell anybody. Only three dozen miracles were performed and they had a very less than prominent role in the ministry. And ironically, miracles throughout Scripture rarely produce faith. So what is their purpose? Are they to show divine power? For Jesus Christ to flex his muscle and remind everybody he's from God? That's certainly a byproduct of it. I mean, not everybody is raising people from the dead. I think that is, suggests he is from the Holy One. But is that the reason? There's really no lasting significance to any of the miracles except the resurrection. He fed some, and four hours later, their stomach growled again. He healed some sick people, and I bet later in life they got sick again. He even raised Lazarus, and <laughs> Lazarus died again. My, my youngest son went to study abroad, and he called us one morning. It was like, I don't know, uh, you know, U.S. time. It was uh, Montgomery time. It was, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning. But he was so excited because he, 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 he went to what he thought, or at least was portrayed as Lazarus' second tomb. But poor Lazarus, you know, who signed him up for that? You know, <laughs> we all worry about dying once and he gets, to, he gets to die twice. What was the purpose of the miracles? Let's look at a couple of them. You know, that first miracle where he turned the water into grape juice. Um, I'm just trying to see if y'all are awake. It's four o'clock. I know it's late. You've had a long day. Turn the water into wine. And this is probably one of the strangest of all the miracles. You know, the Messianic prophecy was that he would 
the Messiah would free the captives. He would lead the people of God and restore Israel. It made no mention of social faux pas, of running out of wine as being his role. Mother asked Jesus, you need to do something. And what was his response? Why do you involve me? My time has not come. Was Jesus the opportunist that saw, wow, at this huge wedding party, a really awful situation, this is a great time to announce that I am the Messiah and I am from God. Was that the motivation? I think if you look at it in context of his life, it was more about compassion. There was nothing significant that was going to happen because he turned water and they had more wine to drink at the wedding feast. But it did show a compassionate heart. John chapter 9, the whole chapter is devoted to the healing of the blind man. Was that divine power just being flexed? Or did it really give us a window into how God thinks about sick and disabled people? The healing of the leper. That's another intriguing miracle when you think about it. Dr. Paul Brand's a leprosy specialist. He said, leprosy does not hurt. There's no pain, no discomfort. And yet there's tremendous suffering. Levitical law required them to live outside the city, keep six feet away from others, the first social distancing, and from others and from no one, absolutely no one to touch them. Mother Teresa and her work in Calcutta, India talked about being around lots of uh, lepers in her life, lifetime. And she said the lepers are the disease of being unwanted. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all use this explosive sentence. Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. That's a powerful statement right there. In light of Levitical law, is this flexing divine power, is there something much more powerful, much more transformative that's being discussed here and shown by Jesus Christ in this miracle? Jesus, who is God, the one who spoke the universe into existence, he touched him. He healed him through touch. The raising of Lazarus, the final miracle. Probably the most compelling. You see this great sense of emotion? It's Jesus Christ. He had announced earlier that he was going. He delayed. I mean, it's just it's all kinds of craziness in that story about his delay and, you know, his arrival. And then to be fraught with emotion. Somehow I believe that there's more going on here than just Jesus saying, I am from God and I have divine power. But there's something so much more significant. If miracles have no lasting significance, and they're more than just God flexing divine muscle, and they rarely produce faith, what's their purpose? I think they're powerful reminders of compassion, mercy, and love, and the impact it has on the world. There's a verse that is, um, I like to read sometimes just because I keep reading it and I don't know that I understand it. And one of these days I'm hoping it's going to pop up. And one of these days this phone will pop back up so I can read it to you. All right. John 14, uh, verse 11, Believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the works themselves. Earlier in the, in the text, he talks about the miracles. So he does give evidence that these are evidence that he is from the Father. So don't get me wrong. I mean, his miracles do give evidence that where he is from. But very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing in and they will do even greater things than these. That's the verse that keeps kicking me. How many people in my life have I prayed over wishing God would heal them? And it didn't happen. How many hungry people in Montgomery, Alabama 
need to be fed, and I wish I could call on the name of the Lord, and they be fed. And how many loved ones have we stand, stood over and wished to God for anything that we could call on the name of the Lord and that they'd be raised? And so for Jesus Christ to make the statement, you will do even greater works than these, is puzzling. But it's not puzzling if you think that the essence of the miracles are not just divine power. They're about something much more transformative than that. They're about God's love, mercy, and compassion that is shared with everybody. The history of Churches of Christ in America traces its roots to the Restoration Movement. The leaders of this movement were attempting to use the Bible as our only guide to restore the first century pattern of the church. I grew up in central Ohio, about 70 miles from Bethany, West Virginia, home of Alexander King. I guess it's been it's close to 20 years from now. I, I was invited to come to Bethany to meet Buck Smith. Buck uh, was a higher education leader and uh, he grew up in the Disciples Movement. He had worked as president of Chapman University in California at a disciple school. He'd worked at a number of disciple schools. He retired and went to the farm in Virginia. He thought, I'm going to spend the rest of my days just, you know, I don't know, counting pigs. I, you know, he just, he thought, I'm done. I've, I've done my duty. But the board called and said, Buck, we got to have you at Bethany. This school's going to close. It's a mess, and we need help. And so I, I got a chance to go meet Buck. At this point, he's 76 years old, back in the saddle, and he's an inspiring kind of guy. And, and, and we were just going to spend a couple hours together. I ended up spending the whole day with him. And at one point, he had to take a phone call, and there I was sitting in his office, Alexander Campbell's office, with the oil painting of the man himself on the wall. It was a moving moment because I thought, how many sermons were crafted in that office? How many publication articles were written and drafted in that very room that deeply impacted my whole family and continues to influence our movement today? We've been deeply impacted by the restoration movement, obviously. But I'll, I'll confess that when the term restoration movement is used, at least when I grew up and even today, it's code language. It's code language. It's code language for first century worship practices. Apostolic teaching that impacts church governance and doctrine. I believe it's time for a new restoration movement. A new restoration that includes biblical teaching. We're not throwing out the biblical teaching as it relates to doctrine. We're not throwing out what we believe God calls Christian worship to look like and what the governance of the church needs to look like. But maybe we need a new movement, a revolution, why don't we restore first century love and mercy? Why don't we start a revolution of compassion? Why don't we revive the apostolic teaching as it relates to generosity? Why don't we reawaken our commitment to evangelism? If the church is going to be relevant in this new millennium, I believe we need to be called to make a difference in the world. Is the exodus of young people a reflection on them or a reflection on us? The church, the holy church of God, was launched in the first century in an absolutely barbaric, pagan Roman culture. 
Most of us are complaining about a culture that is collapsing in our cities, in our nation. But we're a far cry from first century Roman culture. This small revolution was started by 12 teenagers. Most biblical scholars believe the disciples were called somewhere between 18 and 21 years of age. If that doesn't rattle your cage when you read the, the New Testament, I, I've got a 24-year-old, and I, you know it's hard for me to read the text in light of John being Cade's age. I, it's hard for me to, you know, he's a good kid, and you know, I'm proud of him. He's going to be a preacher, and he's going to do a lot for the kingdom of God, but he, he's not the Apostle John right now. I know that. This revolution was started by 12 teenagers. They had no formal training. They had no political capital, but they had the Holy Spirit of God. And the Word indwelled them. And they lived out the teachings of Jesus Christ in a profound way. And I think they lived all of it. Not just the doctrine, but the lifestyle of love, compassion, and mercy. One of my favorite stories regarding a senior Sunday was a, uh, a senior Sunday at a church in West Philadelphia. It's a Mount Carmel church. And they had 12 seniors that came, uh, they were going to graduate this particular year. And they brought them all up front, just like church in Ohio where I grew up. We were all sat on the front row, we got our Bible. And uh, this particular church said, hey, we want uh, each one of you to come to the microphone, introduce yourselves, and tell us a little bit about where you're going. So one by one, they stood for it. My name's Marcus, and I graduated from Carver High School, and I'm going to Penn State. I'm going to study business. Praise God. My name's Jonathan. I also graduated from Carver, and I'll be going to Temple here in Philadelphia, and I'm going to be studying English. Praise God. Hallelujah. Came to number 12, Lucretia. My name is Lucretia. And I graduated from GW. I'm going to Loyola in Maryland. And I got a full scholarship. Praise God. Hallelujah. This church went nuts. I mean, crazy nuts. The thing I didn't tell you that this Mount Carmel church is in West Philadelphia. It is in one of the most impoverished neighborhoods in America. And so when those mamas and daddies and grandparents and aunts and uncles saw those 12 young people standing before them saying, I graduated from high school and I'm going to college and one of them got a full ride to Loyola, this was a celebratory moment. And it, it was just hard to contain. And so then it came time for the minister, D.H. Hoggard, to give a blessing from the church. So he came to the podium and he stood there and he just stared at him for what seemingly was an eternity. Then finally he said, children, children, <clears throat> one of these days you're going to die. Well, that's not exactly how I would start Senior Sunday. <laughs> you know. But needless to say, he had their attention. He said, children, you're going off to college. Are you going off to college to get a BA so you can get your MBA, so you can get your PhD, be CEO of IBM and drive the BMW? <laughs> Children, are you going to college to get a title or a testimony? I preach right there. He went through the Bible within about five minutes. You know, most ministers I know, they're going to take, you know, five months. <laughs> to, to, to do a chapter. He went through the Bible in five minutes. Oh, let me tell you about Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a title. Ruler in Egypt. Big, powerful man. Oh, my sweet Moses. Moses had testimony. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. There's a man with a title. Big title. Oh, sweet Daniel. Sweet Daniel had a testimony. Pilate. Pilate had a testimony or a title, governor, Roman Empire, big man, big title. Oh, my sweet Jesus. He had testimony. I wonder, 
if the new revolution might give them reason to stay. That they wouldn't be so burdened by the impoverished and the brokenness of the world to start a nonprofit, but they'd see the body of Christ as being God's chosen vehicle to bring about the redemption of all things. Most of these young people are graduating from our churches, who are involved in such great activities. They're not part of the nuns. But they've lost interest. We've got to give them a reason to stay. And I think this reason of being a part of God's redemptive work and running into an absolutely collapsing culture with something of the refreshing message of Jesus Christ is something to sink their teeth into. The guys in the back will laugh because they've heard me tell Faulkner students my goal for them is not that they just graduate. I do want them to graduate. <laughs> you know, if you're a parent, I do want them to graduate. <laughs> we want them to graduate, and we want them to be trained and be prepared uh, professionally to go out and be successful in the world. That's part of college. It's a big part of it. But if they come to Faulkner University and all they get is an ex a, a superior education that prepares them to be an accountant or attorney or teacher or healthcare professional, there's 4,000 colleges. It's really no reason for us to exist. But we want students to come and prepare themselves and leave with a kazon. Kazon is a Hebrew term that means vision. And Craig Rochelle, I think, gives the best definition of vision that I've heard. He said, vision is where you take what you uh, love and where does it collide with something that you hate? You take what you're good at, what God has prepared you to do, and where does that collide with something that needs to, to be fixed? Something that's broken. He says that intersection of what I love and what I hate and what I'm good at and what needs to be fixed. It's, it's, it's at that connection point that that gives vision. I think we've got a lot of talented young people in Churches of Christ. And they love God. And they love Jesus Christ. And they got to find that. They got to take their love for God and see the brokenness of the world and see that those things do intersect. And God is calling teenagers like he did in the first century to transform a barbaric culture called the United States of America. We have got to empower them to do something transformative. We think they're leaving because of boredom, and they're absolutely right, but it has nothing to do with Sunday morning. It has to do with leave, leading a passionate life that God calls them to run into the brokenness of humanity and empowers them to do it. We need a new restoration movement. Not one that disregards biblical teachings but one that includes the full teachings of Jesus Christ as it relates to the love compassion and mercy I love the verse in Joshua where they're getting ready to invade Jericho and he says consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you we need to tell young people that God is preparing them to run into an absolutely crazy battle, a battle that doesn't look like it can be won, but God is going to do something amazing through them. We've got to do something in this culture to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, and we're letting the army walk right out the door, and we blame them for it. I think he's calling us. He's calling us to a new revolution. Let's pray together. Dear God, I, I come before your throne humbly. Just thinking about your divine power, that you really did create the world with a whisper. That all things by you move and have their being. 
we fall before you and acknowledge you as the holy sovereign God. And we're humbled by the fact that you sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. We're even more humbled that you place in our hands the work of the kingdom on this earth. We confess our own pride and sin and, and ineptness to carry out this. And so we pray, dear God, that the word of God will dwell in our hearts, will guide our every step. So we pray for the Holy Spirit to indwell us and guide us and shape our every thought, action, word. That we might truly proclaim the teachings of Jesus Christ in this world. We struggle, dear God, knowing with fear and a lack of courage, knowing that the world around us is collapsing. The country that we knew growing up no longer exists. And it's disheartening to watch young people in our church leave. And I pray, dear God, that you might renew our zeal, renew our commitment to evangelism, renew our commitment to an inspired life to do everything we can to stem the tide. I pray, dear God, that you'll be with those high school teachers in our Bible classes, that you'll empower them, that they'll bring alive the Word of God to impassion these young people to live faithful. I pray for parents. I just pray for strength and courage for parents to to see the challenges of this culture and that they might do everything they can to godly support these young people. Dear God, although our courage and fear wanes, we know that you that live within us is greater than the one who lives in the world. And so, dear God, empower us to take that great promise and launch out in faith and advance the kingdom of God in this place. We're thankful for your word to be a lamp to our feet. We're thankful for the body of Christ and events like this that inspire us and encourage us to be faithful and be creative and, and dynamic and, and, and forge forward with a, a spirit of confidence. Dear God, we're mindful that uh, one day this suffering and pain will end and, and we long for the day that you reappear and, and that we'll be taken home to be with you forever. And it's with that confidence we give you thanks. And I pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just like college students, you get extra credit you know, when you let them out early. So, you're blessed. <laughs>